So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Good morning from uh, Greece. Um, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice pleasure to have uh, among with us uh, Dr. Konstantinos Daskalakis. Uh, apart that, he's a friend, is an ex, a very talented uh, scientist. Let me also uh, accept the, the the participants. Kostas uh, holds a bachelor degree in material science and technology with specialization in microelectronics from the University of Crete in 2010. Then he get his, uh, he got his, his master degree in material science and technology from the University of Crete in 2011. He moved to Imperial College to continue his uh, research studies and uh, he uh, got a PhD in physics in 2014. Um, and uh, he continued in Imperial College until in 2016 as a postdoctoral fellow. And then he moved to Aldo University as a, as a Marie Curie fellow. Um, in 2020, he received the prestigious ERC grant. And now he's, uh, he's, still, he's still in Finland, but in the Turku University. And uh, the floor is yours, Costandinos, in order to present us the exciting uh, field of polaritonic light emitting diodes. Thank you very much for your participation and your time to be with us. Thank you, Costas. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Thank you, Costas, for the introduction. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here with you. Um, just go ahead to share my screen. And um, so hopefully you can all see. So yeah, today the talk uh, will be on uh, polaritonics for improving the performance in uh, light emitting devices. And essentially what I will try to do today is I would like to explain you uh, what uh, these polaritons are and uh, how we make uh, this kind of polaritonic devices and also give you somehow an overview of this polariton field, uh, what has been done, where we are going to, and just generally give you some behind the scenes information. Uh, but before I start discussing about my uh, work and polariton side, I just uh, want to mention that I recently moved to uh, Turku uh, in Finland. It's a very beautiful city in uh, Southwest coast of Finland, you can see um, it's only uh, 150 kilometers away from Helsinki. An interesting uh, fact is that uh, Turku used to be the capital of Finland, and just uh, I think the last 20 years, uh, Helsinki became the uh, capital. Uh, you can see it's located near to the sea, uh, it's next to Stockholm and Tallinn. And in Turku, now we are at Turku University where we start things from the beginning. It's a new adventure. So from the 1st of January, we will have the new Faculty of Technology and we will start our new Department of Mechanical and uh, Materials Engineering, where I will have my uh, Luminous Materials and Device Research Group, LMT. And uh, I get this opportunity to advertise uh, some uh, position openings in my group. So if uh, someone has a physics background, you know, spectroscopy lasers, or an electrical engineering background, um, please do send me an email so I can send you the link to apply for the position. Also people who have worked with OLEDs or similar devices, um, the project will be part of this ERC starting CRUD project. And uh, you will have the opportunity to work to uh, state-of-the-art devices and uh, exciting research fields. So today the talk outline, um, first we will basically discuss about light and matter interactions, which is the foundation for polarifons. We need first to know a little bit about how uh, light interacts with matter and what this really means. Then we will focus on the specific field that I'm working on, which is the microcavity polariton. So I will explain how this light matter interactions extend to the microcavity polaritons. I will give you some examples of uh, polaritonic devices and the research on this field. And then um, we'll move on to uh, using organic semiconductors 
and polaritonics for uh, making more practical applications out of these polaritonic devices. And then I will give you a brief glimpse of uh, my ERC project and what I will be working on. So this is a very nice picture, I think, that explains very nicely what uh, light and matter interactions is. And we see our light source here is the sun and the materials on Earth basically uh, is the interaction that we see with our eyes in everyday life. So when we preserve images and colors, this is a form of light matter interaction. But essentially what it is, is the sunlight emits this light spectrum that uh, extends from the UV to the far IR. So this is the spectrum of sun, the sunlight. And there is this narrow band in the visible, which are the colors that we can observe uh, with an uh, eyes. So these colors are usually from blue to uh, red. And for instance, when we see these colors here in the picture from the sunlight, there are many different type of uh, light interacting with matter. So it can be absorption, it can be some luminescence effects, scattering, reflection, and other type of interactions. And these results into what we see with our own eyes. Of course, when we are talking about uh, light, we are talking about the photon and the electromagnetic radiation in the photon. And in our case, we are focusing mostly in the materials that we are focused on are semiconductors, such as crystalline semiconductors, inorganic semiconductors, like silicon, gallium nitride, gallium arsenide, maybe some of you know about these materials. Then another category of materials that we are working on are atoms and also molecules, in particular molecular semiconductors. Now, more specifically to microcavity polarities. So how do we deal with these light matter interactions? So in our lab, we are trying to essentially force or manipulate the interactions of light and matter. And a very good way to do this is we can use a microcavity so we can control the light part. And the microcavity you can understand very simply. Um, essentially, it's just uh, two mirrors facing, facing each other. And you can think like every time you have a mirror and you have a light source, light bounces on the mirror backwards. So when you have two mirrors facing each other and you have an emitter in the middle, then the light that is emitted, it bounces back and forth in between the two mirrors almost forever. And it doesn't have the opportunity really to escape. But what happens is that if you create a spacing between the mirrors that has a length, which is almost the size of light, or as we call multiples of lambda half, due to some interference effects, essentially you open a door in, uh, in these mirrors uh, for light to escape out. And we can actually see this light coming out by using uh, typical spectroscopy techniques, by studying the color of the light that comes out at the different angles, we can get access to what's happening inside the cavity or the micro cavity. Uh, the second part, um, in order to make polaritons and to control these light matter interactions is the excitons. And the two most well-known examples of excitons we found in uh, inorganic semiconductors, and there the excitons are called wenger mohr excitons. And what is an exciton? Essentially, is a bound state between an electron and a hole. So in the crystal, you have electrons uh, floating inside the crystal and because uh, they can uh, basically interact between an electron and hole, they create this bound state, which we call electron, exciton. And uh, we also have Frenkel type of excitons. And the difference between wenger mohr excitons and Frenkel mohr excitons is basically this um, Bohr radius. So like the, what is the size extent of the exciton? In uh, wenger mohr excitons, they have much larger Bohr radius compared to the Frenkel excitons. And this uh, gives some uh, 
let's say, properties to these excitons. So for Wernier more excitons, you have very small binding energy. So basically it's very easy to break the exciton here. It most of the times breaks even at room temperature. So even the thermal energy of the environment is enough for these two to decouple. Uh, while in Frenkel excitons, because we find those excitons mostly in molecular semiconductors, so the exciton is really localized in the molecular level, the bore radius is very small. So therefore the electron and hole are very close to each other and the binding energy is extremely high. So usually in this type of systems, the excitons are very robust and they live at high temperatures, which is an advantage as I will show you later. So how do we create the lightons then? So if we have this uh, micro cavity, as I explained before, where we can trap light and really squeeze it in and make it uh, bounce back and forth the mirrors without really escaping. And in between there, we put some excitonic emitter. So the exciton we saw before, then the light that is trapped in the mirror starts to interact strongly, strongly with the exciton and creating some uh, new eigenstates. And essentially what happens is because, I'm going back here, because the photon goes in and out, uh, in and out with the uh, exciton. So basically the exciton absorbs the photon, re-emits the photon and so on and so forth. But this happens extremely fast and extremely quickly. The exciton energy and the photon energy are indistinguishable anymore. So they hybridize and they create two new eigenstates that are called upper polariton and lower polariton states. So here, this is just a schematic of the different energy levels where you see that when you have the photon energy in the cavity or the trapped photon energy in the cavity to be at the same level with the exton level of your material and you couple them strongly, then they create these two uh, eigenstates. So what you will see out of your system is basically two, two states. Instead of one state, you will see two that can absorb and emit light almost uh, uh, at the same time. And these uh, states are essentially hybrid because they consist uh, from light and matter. So they have the best properties of both light and matter. The other thing, because you see they change uh, how these states are, they change their energy levels, we can use this kind of uh, hybridization and this kind of splitting to engineer optical, electrical, and chemical properties uh, of our materials, of our semiconductors. Mostly, uh, I, am I will be focusing on optical and electrical properties of these materials, but there are also some chemical interactions now, uh, nowadays that polaritons are used for enhancing those uh, chemical uh, uh, catalysis and so on. What we actually see in the lab is not just this uh, schematic, but we see actually dispersions, energy dispersions. So what we see is that uh, the light from our cavity at what angle is emitted at what energy. So we see usually this type of dispersions. And this weak coupling case is basically when you uh, have your photon and exonot at the same energy, but they are not strongly coupled. So basically they act independently. So this is what you will read with your uh, spectrometer. And when you have strong coupling, this image totally changes, especially the lower polariton takes this uh, peculiar parabolic looking shape. And we can utilize later on for engineering our, uh, our material properties. Um, this is the labs usually we are doing this type of experiments. Uh, they look quite messy. And what you usually have, you have some uh, laser. It's really big laser usually, like all the behind the table is a laser. And it can be a femtosecond, like a very fast laser that you can modulate its output pulse. And you can move, uh, you can transfer the laser pulse to where your sample sits. In this case, our sample will sit somewhere here. So we can excite our system with some form. 
So this is optical excitation most of the times, but no, nowadays uh, many people are working on electrical excitation. So you can have some kind of power supply and both, uh, uh, voltage potential and current to your system to generate your excitation. And then from there on, you can have your optics where you collect the light that comes out of the sample and image it on a spectrometer that it sits some, somewhere here. So we can see all these uh, dispersions that I described before. And the polaritonic samples, uh, they sound really cool and exciting, but basically uh, they look uh, usually like this. You mostly see the substrate that are made of. Uh, this is an inorganic gallium nitride polaritonic sample. So basically this is just the gallium nitride substrate and because this uh, micro cavity structures are thin film multilayers on top of the substrate that they do not extend more than a micrometer uh, length, uh, height, essentially you cannot see them by naked eye. So it's just a film essentially. This is another example where we use organic semiconductors to uh, have our polaritonics. So this is basically a simple glass substrate and uh, some thin film, multiple thin film layers of materials that we create these micro cavities. Again, it's almost no visible. This is a little bit different case because in this case, we want to have polaritonic OLEDs. So we want to do excitation with uh, electricity. So you need to make some kind of pixelized structures and have some cables in order to be able to apply some voltage in the system. So this looks a little bit more uh, this looks a little bit cooler than the other two cases. And uh, what these polaritonic devices essentially do and how they can be used. In the beginning, when people somehow invented polaritons, um, they didn't really know what to do about them. There was not much application. But um, later on in the research, uh, they found out that under the right conditions, they can create uh, polariton lasers, which microscopically uh, look like standard lasers. So this kind of strong uh, directional light coming out of a laser, it will be the same. But because the processes that this uh, polariton lasing or blazing is generated in these polariton devices, so the processes there are very, very different. It has shown that you can achieve this lasing at uh, much lower uh, powers. So basically you need much less power to achieve this lasing. And then people were start thinking, okay, we have such an efficient system, which is almost thousand times, it requires a thousand times less pump powers in order to generate this lasing, this uh, non-linearity, what can we do with this? And the first idea will be to make uh, all optical computers. And you all know how a transistor probably works. So the same thing, but instead of electricity, you can use light and light pulses. So this is a nice image here. So you can use basically a pump that uh, generates the polaritons but they have very small uh, amount of emissions, so very small amount of lights coming out. But then because you go to this nonlinear regime, when you give a little bit of extra pump power, suddenly you see 10 or 100 or 1000 time increase in the emission. So essentially you can use a very weak gate signal. So a very weak, let's say data pulse to switch quickly on and off the light that comes out from the sample. Essentially create a uh, system like a transistor where you can have zero and ones coming out or amplified. And there was really a blooming of this all optical transition and light and load six studies the, until 2014. Um, they could really see that these transistors uh, or this kind of devices, they can generate nicely as optical circuits. Uh, they could also induce optical parametric amplification uh, in this type of samples, which is another nonlinear effect, very similar to uh, the lasing I explained, at least macroscopically. 
And also the modulation can be extremely fast. So this is very important if you want to have a quick switch. In addition, uh, this type of uh, polytonic uh, samples uh, allowed for uh, a big degree of freedom in studying fundamental science and fundamental physics. And uh, as I explained before, these polytons are a mixture of light and matter. And this light part in polaritons gives them extremely low effective mass. And uh, for those who know about these bonsai time condensation experiments, that they use these helium rubidium atoms, which are basically liquids, and you have to cool them down to almost absolute zero, you can go to a new state of matter that called bonsai time condensate. But now with polaritons, because they are much lighter, uh, almost eight orders of magnitude lighter compared to the rubidium atom, you could do the same time of experiments, but at much higher temperatures, thus simplifying the experiment itself. In addition, you could study this kind of very complicated uh, experiments and Bose-Einstein condensation, uh, but just simply using a spectrometer, which uh, makes the life in the lab much easier. Moreover, people have also observed superfluidity in this type of structures. And for our terminology, superfluidity essentially means that if let's say you have some slab of material that light propagates in it, and effectively you will have some defect there, which is a bad thing, then when light goes through the defect, it scatters back and you have losses in the system. But in the superfluid regime, when there is a uh, reflect, because you have a superfluid, it doesn't really have any friction there, so light can go through the defect without any scattering, so therefore no losses. And uh, there were a huge number of high impact publications coming uh, out from this type of research. However, there was always this big problem, and uh, you had to do the experiments at cryogenic temperatures, or all these devices, they need to be in a cryostat at uh, 10 Kelvin in order to be able to uh, see these effects, which is not something practical. And also the materials used in the fabrication methods in these devices, they will involve molecular beam epitaxy and very complicated and time consuming methods, which again, it's not something that you will uh, be practical when you wanna have an actual device to use in your everyday life. And the problem was again, this uh, it was mainly the Banger mode exciton and the small binding energy I was, as I explained before, which essentially you cannot have polaritons because at higher temperatures, you don't have excitons anymore because they essentially be associated just because of thermal energy in the environment. And this is why the uh, community of polaritons shifted towards this organic Frenkel type of excitons because uh, the large binding energy of the exciton in this type of uh, semiconductors or materials is extremely high. Therefore, you can achieve polaritons at room temperatures and ambient conditions uh, relatively easy. And here, this again, I explain how this uh, radius and binding energy relate to the materials and to organic semiconductors. Now, Another great advantage of these organic semiconductors is that they allow for fabrication flexibility. Most of the times you can make these samples with uh, simple uh, thermal deposition techniques. So in some vacant chamber by just heating up some materials, you can make thin films, high quality thin films and make these organic micro cavities and that can support polaritons. And uh, this gives a force greater advantage for future applications. So both that they can operate at room temperature and they can be fabricated with simple fabrication techniques. And this is uh, where I uh, start working on. I start working with these organic polaritons and organic micro cavities. And when I was doing my PhD at Imperial, um, essentially we were uh, the first group to demonstrate this polariton lasing, as I explained before, that was demonstrated previously with the inorganic type of uh, polaritons. And this is, was a big step forward because now we can uh, use 
a much simpler system to fabricate polar electronic devices and demonstrate all this or study the fundamental physics uh, studies that I described before. And since we have a totally new system, we did some quite sophisticated type of experiments involved uh, interferometry, um, where we can study all the spatial and temporal coherence properties of our new uh, polariton laser. And uh, we even managed to demonstrate uh, superfluidity or this suppression of scattering when light is propagating in a, in a piece of material. And uh, this was great news, but of course, um, for me, I wanted to go a little bit further and I wanted to really uh, work on something more applied. And that's why I moved towards organic light emitting diodes. So my ERC project essentially will be involving these polaritonics and try to improve these organic light emitting diodes. And for those who don't know what an organic light emitting diode is, it is essentially a diode that emits light, uh, constructed mostly from organic materials. And how does it work is, so you uh, have thin films of different types of materials where you sandwich some emitter material between a hole injection layer and an electron injection layer. And by applying an electric field and a tiny bit of current, what you are trying to do is you are trying to move holes from your anode to the homo level of your organic emitter. And at the same time, push electrons from the electron injection layer or the cathode to the LUMO of uh, your organic emitter. And now, if these electrons and holes meet at the same place, the same time, they have high probability to recombine and emit a photon out. So this is how light can be generated from these diodes. Unfortunately, organic semiconductors and organic materials are not very efficient for generating light. And this comes mostly from the fact that when you apply some uh, electrical excitation, most of the excitations end up going to this uh, so-called triplet states, which are uh, states that they do not emit light efficiently. So most of it becomes heat. And only 25% uh, goes to these singlet states, which are the states that uh, the organic emitters emit light. So they are very lossy. Only essentially 25% will become light theoretically, because the reality is that in this type of system, there are many, many, many more mechanisms that use losses. And this is just a diagram of all the different mechanisms. So it's very complex and very complicated. And uh, this is what we will try to avoid. And the idea on how to improve this OLED is not, uh, is coming from something that is not something new. It's been around for uh, decades. And it's a process that is called reverse intersystem crossing, which uh, essentially, how does it work? So when you have this uh, emitting state, singlet state, that, that uh, is very close to a non-emitting triplet state, the, this uh, gap essentially is small, then the excitations that live in this non-emitting state can jump up to the singlet state thermal processes. It's an upconversion essentially process and essentially take the excitations that otherwise will have been lost in heat, put them back to the energy level where they can become a light. And this way you can uh, harvest light. And the idea now with polaritons is you can hybridize this singlet. So basically take this concept of reverse intersystem crossing and the concept of polaritons that you can split these states and bring one lower in energy and one higher in energy, combine them and start harvesting this uh, triplet or non-emissive excitations to a state that can emit light. So the concept here essentially is find weights, uh, engineer
very good material the way of improving the bullets and the ERC idea is that now you can actually have um, multiple ladders of collitons uh, that you can harvest energies from many uh, triplet energy levels. And emission can happen from these polariton modes at different colors. So essentially, without using any doping for converting uh, your OLED color to white color, for instance, we can purely use polaritonics and engineer the state so you can emit multiple colors. And uh, essentially, with this, I think uh, I can go to the outlook of my talk today. So the reality is that there are no real applications at the moment uh, using polaritons or polaritonics. Mostly the research is focused on standing, uh, the fundamental studies. It really is a very good system for that because the experimental conditions are uh, very good. You can simply use some camera and a spectrometer to study all these uh, fascinating effects we see in the systems. And, uh, at least myself, uh, I think that the future direction that polaritons can be useful and can be something of, can cause some real application is improving these organic light emitting dev devices and diodes uh, if you manage to engineer everything properly. So with this, uh, I would like, of course, to thank all my collaborators all these years. Uh, this research, of course, was not done just by myself. There were many people involved. And of course, you for uh, your attention. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Costas, for this uh, interesting talk. I would remind you that when the lasers have been invented, the scientific community welcomed them a solution without a problem. So probably for polaritons, it will be the same. Uh, the years will show uh, their impact to the science, but it looks very exciting. Uh, any questions? For, now you can, um, I think that you can switch on your cameras and if you have uh, questions, please um, raise your hand or switch on your uh, microphone and uh, ask Costas directly. Um, any questions? Uh. Yes, Yorgos, the floor yeah, is yours. Let's see. So, is my camera on? I don't... No, now it, it comes on. Well, first of all, very nice talk. Uh, I have two questions, uh, Costas, for you. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. The, the first has to do with this... Uh, I mean, uh, uh, in these studies, uh, with uh, creating uh, diodes which emit uh, light. Uh, you said that you have 25% uh, uh, probability for creating the uh, singlet state and 75% uh, for the triplet. Did I understand this correctly? Uh, uh, organic light emitting diodes. So yeah. this is a theoretical optimum, like maximum efficiency you will see there. It has to do with spin orbit. It's a statistical effect, basically. Yeah, but this is because you have the, the triplet state and the singlet state, is it not so? Uh, yeah, so you have both states in organics. Yes. And most of the excitations, so when you put, when you pump your system electrically, most of them end up going to triplets. So my question is, for example, in exotons in cuprous oxide, uh, the singlet and the triplet state are not degenerate. I mean, there is a splitting because of the exchange interaction. Do you not have such an effect uh, in your system? Uh, so it's slightly different, I think. Um, but um, so the thing with organic semiconductors is uh, these triplet states are essentially, they have the spins uh, parallel aligned. So it's a forbidden state. Like, so basically in order to make the uh, radiation happens, it has to somehow the electron to flip, which is a forbidden process. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, it's a different system in organics, in organic semiconductors, I think. 
but they are they, they are also degenerate states they are it's just that the system is very complex they are degenerate you're saying yeah yeah i see a second question has to do with this superfluid properties that you observed in a paper that you cited. Uh, so my question is, I mean, this is apparently a non-equilibrium system because you pump energy, you have losses. I mean, to what extent should I think about this as an equilibrium, you know, condensate like... No, it's not, it's not an equilibrium. Yeah, it's not really an equilibrium. I mean, it's a dynamic system. So essentially you constantly pump and there is a mission. So it's some type of dynamic equilibrium. Yes. But it's not the real superfluid you will see from ultra, ultra cold atomic gases. Yes. We, nowadays, I think only everybody in the community has agreed this is a slightly different. It's just how we call it. And what we see is really when you have some light propagating in your sample and you have a, a defect there, it really suppresses the scattering. Means that like a superfluid, it doesn't have friction anymore. So it can flow without really any barriers. So there is somehow, uh, I think it's more, mostly symbolic nowadays, the, the name rather than uh, pragmatic. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, we're well. For the questions, I think that Ivanis Dremediakis has has raised his hand. I don't know. We cannot hear you, Yanis. All right. Until uh, Ioannis will uh, fix his audio, uh, do we have any other questions from the from the audience? So, if this is the case, I have some questions for you. What's that? Ah, okay. Yes, Michalis, go ahead. Uh, in order to understand better, this is actually uh, an understanding uh, question. Yeah. I know about the exciton polaritons, which have been observed in, uh, in experiments uh, uh, in copper oxide. So this is very common in copper oxides to, to, to do such experiments and excite uh, the so-called exciton polaritons. The polaritons that you have presented today and are uh, associated to organic materials are of the same nature. It is exciton polaritons, yes. So basically we call these organics just because we are using organic semiconductors, that's all. I see. I see. Otherwise the physics is exactly the same. So exciton polaritons, of course, if you have a slab and somehow you can couple light into your system and couple it to the exciton, it can be through some prism. It doesn't need to be a cavity, right? So if you have the coupling of light to the exciton, you have a polariton. Um, we are using micro cavities because uh, basically we can have a solid state system like the confinement of light in between the mirrors in the excitonic material or all in the same plane. And you don't need any light special angles of coupling light in. So basically you can just pump your system at whatever angle, or you can even pump it electrically and you can generate those polariton states. Yes, thank but you. But otherwise the physics is the same, yeah. Yes, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, Michalis, for the question. Any other question from the audience? Yes, Yorgos Piropoulos. Costa, great talk. Also, congratulations for the uh, ERC. Like a big, very nice, man. Um, I wanted to ask you something about the polariton logics, actually. So first of all, I, I wanted to ask you more or less about what kind of speeds we are talking about. <laughs> like yeah, so time response of like what, nanoseconds? Uh, so uh, I, even though I haven't really worked on this field, uh, people have so picoseconds, uh, tens of picoseconds responses. So this is, I don't know, the rise time or the fall time. <laughs> But again, depends on the material. So for organics, again, it's slower. Uh, for inorganics, because anyways, the processes there can be faster. I, I think it can go something like tens of picoseconds, but I'm not 100% sure. Nice. And the other thing that I wanted to ask you, which is relevant to that actually, again, like for the polariton logics, is that like, if I got it correctly, like you can have like a bias from the current and you kind of like create a cascade amplifying effect by changing polariton states by illuminating uh, the light then like separating the states right 
No, there is no cascade effect. So basically, you just take advantage of the nonlinearity that you have created. So you have a system, you create a system that is becoming nonlinear when you are increasing the pump power. So essentially, by adding a little bit of more pump, a tiny bit amount, you suddenly get a tenfold, hundredfold, thousandfold increase in your light output. And this you can do in different methods. So for instance, you can have, if you can have an electrically activated, let's say, diode, polariton diode or transistor, you can bring it into the regime just before the threshold, just before the nonlinearity level. And then by pumping with some optical uh, data signal, let's say, right? The system, then it can start amplifying. So this can be an amplification mechanism. Uh, low, but they are just basically, I don't think there is any limitation or a specific application. I think mo most of these are just generic demonstrations of uh, so copying the electrical uh, transistors and all these properties. They just try to represent the same thing with uh, optics and with polaritons. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jorgo, for the question. Any other question from the audience? Uh, if this is the case, Costas, I have some questions uh, for you. First of all, uh, what is what are the um, uh, advantages of the polariton lasers compared to the traditional uh, traditional lasing and lasing devices uh, that all of us we know? Uh, can we generate lasing uh, with a population without uh, requesting this population inversion condition? Yeah, so this is um, the polariton lasing does not require population inversion because the mechanism is you're trying to, let's say, depopulate your excitation to uh, some kind of uh, exciton reservoir state, which is some kind of equilibrium state. And from there, they, the polaritons will relax to the ground state almost uh, spontaneously. Mm -hmm. And then the stimulated factor comes from um, bosonic final state stimulation. Mm -hmm. They are very similar concepts actually to population inversion. But uh, what happens is in practice that when polariton laser, when you want to make a laser, you, have, you need to have broken the exciton because you need to have electrons and holes in order to uh, inverse them, right? Mm -hmm. But in polaritons, this happens already below this uh, mod density. So basically the exciton is still alive, which is usually at much lower energies, uh, pop energies. Mm -hmm. So therefore you still see this lasing. Uh, in fact, with polaritons, if you pump them much harder, uh, you can start deassociating the breaking down, let's say the exciton and actually having electrons and holes and then you will go to the second regime where it will be with population inversion. So it will be the same process like lasers. So usually in this type of polariton uh, lasers, you will have two thresholds. One will be the polariton threshold at much lower pump powers. And then you will go to the typical population inversion threshold where you've broken your elect uh, exciton and you achieve now population inversion. Mm -hmm. And regarding the emission characteristics of these two thresholds, do we have any differences? regarding uh, the lasing operation, because if you can achieve without population inversion, the pumping threshold and the pump and the energy that we spend is much lower, which makes a very attractive lasing system. Am I right? It is very attractive, but it's not very uh, robust. Mm -hmm. So first of all, all these uh, studies, as I said, with these high quality samples are done at cryogenic temperatures, because in this type of materials, the exciton, the problem now it's the exciton that doesn't survive at room temperature. So this double threshold that I discussed, uh, you need to be at very low temperatures. Okay. Okay. So it's, you can break the exciton first by heating it up at room temperature, or you can pump it very hard. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, if you want to have a system that works uh, in the space where it's absolute zero, this is very good because you will have a more efficient laser. But for everyday application, uh, you cannot. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, and this, and this organic lasers now is a good idea because um, essentially you can generate uh, lasing with organics that polariton polariton lasing can survive at room temperatures. But then the organic systems are not very efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, most most has to do with the uniformity and because there are amorphous systems and the molecules are not 
oriented perfectly. So there are many losses. How you, when you pump it, how much it absorbs, it's very lossy. So again, the threshold is, uh, I mean, my Polariton laser and the best organic laser were having almost the same kind of uh, thresholds. So not that much more efficient. Mm -hmm. And Costas, it seems that one of the most attractive characteristics in order to achieve this uh, or to build this or operate this polaritonic light emitting devices, it is the high exciton binding energy, which is in comparison with the materials that we use in solar cells. So in solar cells, you need a very low uh, binding energy in order to split easier the generated um, ele uh, pairs, electrons in the holes. So, uh, so this means that the materials that they are very good in uh, solar harvesting are not appropriate for polaritonic applications? Yeah, I think this is pretty much uh, what it is. I think there have been some studies trying to use polariton, the polariton idea for improving solar cells in uh, disensitized and this organic semiconductor type of solar cells. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, it doesn't make much sense because in order to have polaritons, you need excitons that live long. And uh, for solar cells, you need to have your excitons deassociate as fast as possible. However, um, there are many arguments on this, uh, for instance, when you are you want in solar cells you want your excitons to add, to deassociate very fast in order to don't have this kind of interactions with polarons and other lossy mechanisms right so it's all about the dynamics of the, all the processes so how fast something bad will happen before the good will happen right mm -hmm. with when you have strong coupling you protect your exciton so basically what happens is that you have your exciton coupled so therefore, the probability of interacting with some polarons or other loss, loss channel drops. So therefore, you don't really necessarily need your exciton to deassociate as fast anymore. This is just some ideas, but it really depends what the system you are working on and what you are looking for. And uh, understanding also the dynamics is extremely important because essentially you are just trying to fight the good with the bad, whichever comes first wins. So you can play with this type of things. Mm -hmm. But I'm not an expert on this field, so I'm probably I, I, there are more things out there. Okay. So and the last question that I have, and I'm sorry for this, is like um, it seems that the interaction between the excitons and the photons they generate the splitting of the energies, which is the upper and the the upper and the lower uh, polariton uh, polariton states. What is the lifetime of this kind of generation of these energy levels during the interaction? I mean, what is the lifetime of this interaction? And what are the parameters that affect this interaction? So the, I don't know now if you are talking about the Rabi flopping, the Rabi splitting. The Rabi splitting, yes. So yeah, the Rabi splitting is, uh, depends again the system. So with organics, um, it's extremely fast, it's femtoseconds. Uh, in inorganics, it can be picoseconds. It has to do a lot with the lifetime of the system. And experimentally, what are the parameters that you control in order to increase or prolong this interaction? So actually, what we, what we do in the experiment is we can make this splitting that you saw about the upper and lower polariton get smaller or bigger. Again, in between some kind of uh, the material is the upper limit again. But what we do is how we uh, add essentially the cavity energy and the exton energy, we can detune the cavity energy and change a little bit the splitting. Or what we do usually is we change the density of excitons. So if we consider that every molecule of organic semiconductor we have is one exciton, by changing the density of exciton, we change the coupling strength, which is the Rabi splitting. So essentially, the less molecules you have, the smaller the splitting will be, the weaker the coupling will be. Yes. Yes. And the more, the, the more you put, the bigger the coupling. And uh, of course, there is a limit because if you go too little, then you won't have any coupling at all. So you will not have polaritons anymore. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Costas. Before we finish, I will go to the chat. In, uh... Costas, Costas. Yes, please. Can I, can I discuss uh, something with the other Costas? 
Of course. I mean, yes. Costas, it came into my mind now uh, a publication. I think it was in uh, 2018 from MIT and Harvard uh, about uh, the uh, pairs of triplets of uh, photons generated when uh, when uh, a weak laser was uh, a weak laser illuminated a cloud of ultra cold uh, atoms. I think it was uh, rubidium atoms. Yeah. Is your is your work related to to such kind of uh, research? Uh, in the group I was working at Aldo, they were working with ultra cold atomic gases. Uh, the system is um, I don't know the work you are talking about probably. So this is uh, I'm not sure if I can answer correctly, but the molecule molecules also act as a semiconductor. So. It can be a semiconductor as uh, the idea of this band cap, or you can have, of course, the atomic levels, because again, these excitons are not really excitons, are just transitions. So absorption transitions with strong molecular uh, dipole moment. So in theory, it can be an ultra cold atomic gas system or atomic system or semiconductor, it doesn't really matter. So deeply in the uh, quantum mechanics, you are just looking into dipole moments and transition strengths. Yes. So I'm not sure, but maybe you can, I don't know, maybe you can ask again if I... Yeah, we can discuss this because uh, they, they actually uh, presented that and they called these uh, newly weighted down light particles because they, they proved that the photons, although they do not have mass, uh, they, they, they somehow, I'm not, I don't know if I described if I describe it correctly, but they they hire some mass from the electrons. The, the actually, photons do have mass, especially if you put them in a cavity. I mean, that's the whole point. So if you have some optical system, you have dispersion, and dispersion causes an effective mass in the system. And then you can, of course, if you have a mass, not massless photon, you can start playing with the nonlinearities there. So okay, it puts so it in a, I guess because this ultra cold atomic gas is I'm not sure now if they make so some kind of potential also there, because so it should be. It's maybe connected, but anyway, we, we can discuss this. We can discuss yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, it's not really, I'm not an expert on this kind of thing, so probably I don't know what I'm talking now, but yeah, it's interesting. So I think that we are close to finishing. I mean, Costas, there are a lot of comments for your presentation on the chat. I think that you can have a look from Ioannis Kaliakatsos. I really thank you very much, Costas, excellent talk. Is uh, my first talk uh, I hear about polaritons and I understood what are exactly. I will be interested to follow how you can increase the lifetime of the OLED using polaritons. This will help the engineers to design and produce OLED displays, which will overcome the problem of the time life of this type of displays. Uh, then, uh, um, then we go to Ioannis uh, Remediakis. Thank you, Kostantine. Excellent presentation and very clear presentation. And from Stratakis, and uh, a lot of congratulations, uh, Professor Stratakis, a lot of congratulations for your presentation. So at this point, I would like to thank the uh, attendees and also the presenter for this uh, nice talk. We would like to wish to Costas good luck to his new career in uh, Turku University and all the best. And uh, we hope that uh, Costandinos will be a collaborator of Hellenic Mediterranean University Research Institution and, and University in general, and of course, uh, a partner and collaborator in, with all of you. So, Costa Dinos, thank you very much for thank you very much. your contribution. Thank you. And uh, I thank hope you. that I will see you next Friday. We have another exciting talk, again related with lasers from Professor Papadogiannis. And uh, hope to see you next Friday at uh, 11 o'clock Greek time and 10 o'clock CET. This generates a confusion. I can see, you know, some participants. They are coming, they are logged in at 12 o'clock, but uh, I think that I'm clear in my messages that it's 11 o'clock Greek time and 10 o'clock CET. So thank you very much, all of you. Have a nice day and be safe. Bye. Thank yes, you very much. Bye-bye. Yes. Have a good day.